Every single day, you and I fight the greatest battle of our lives. Hi, I'm Zachary Barnhart from the West Virginia School of Preaching, and you're watching Light from Above. And I'm grateful uh, and honored to be a guest on this program. And today in this lesson, I want to look at the story of David and Goliath. Now, the story of David and Goliath has, has long been a popular story ta uh, about uh, used as, for motivational purposes, as an underdog story, as defeating the odds or the small beating the big. But I believe that this view misses the mark of what the, the story of David and Goliath really means for Christians. And we're going to look at that here. But before we get into that, let's look at, we need to set the, uh, what's going on in the story, explain what's happening. So if we look here at, at the conflict, we see uh, that in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, it says the Israelites and the Philistines uh, were in a standoff. And they're wait, they on opposite sides waiting for the other to make the first move. And during the standoff, out of the Philistine army comes a champion named Goliath. Now, Goliath was certainly a champion. He's described as being around nine feet tall. He's, he's covered head to toe in armor. And Goliath calls out to Israel for them to send him a man to fight him. And the winner would determine the enslavement of one of the two nations. If Goliath wins, then Israel will be enslaved by the Philistines. But if Goliath loses, then the Philistines will be enslaved by the Israelites. But they were afraid of this challenge. Uh, 1 Samuel 17 verse 11 says that Saul and all of Israel were afraid of this. In fact, they were so afraid of him that no Israelite arose to the challenge for 40 days. For 40 days, Goliath came out morning and evening challenging them. And no one stepped forward. And it wouldn't be until verse 32 that David finally decides to fight Goliath. Again, th this, is, this is the context of what's going on here. So David is about to fight Goliath. He's about to go into battle. And this story of David and Goliath, the story of, of this battle, ha has long been a popular story and it is a great demonstration of, of faith in God's deliverance of his people. But David's battle with Goliath is similar to man's battle with Satan, to, to our conflict with Satan. Because if, if Goliath wins, well, Israel will be enslaved by the Phil uh, by Philistines. But if Satan wins... We will be enslaved in sin, and which leads to eternal suffering. See, this is a battle of great importance. This is a battle that you, we cannot afford to lose. We need to win this battle. So in this lesson, we're going to look at what David did to win his battle and how we can uh, apply it to our lives to win ours. The first thing we're going to look at are the weapons of the battle. Now, I, as David goes to step out, on the battlefield, Saul tries to equip David with armor, but David can't use it. It, it, it. It's not fitting him properly. David can't take this out to fight Goliath. So as an alternative weapon, David gathers five stones because, uh, for his sling that he was going to use. And David later uses these stones to take down Goliath. You see, David's weapon was a stone, but the weapon of a Christian is the Bible. As David gathered the stones, Christians must study the Bible. We must gather the information in the scriptures. If you look here in Acts 17, verse 11, he says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness, and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. These Christians here in Acts were, were searching the scriptures daily. They were studying the God's word. They were studying the scriptures. That way, no false doctrines could get by them. In case someone came along and started to teach them false things, tried to mislead them, they would be ready for this. Jesus warned us about this as well. We look in Matthew 7, verse 15 to 16. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Jesus is warning us about false prophets, about false teachers that are going to come and try to mislead us. They're going to bring a message that seems like the gospel, that seems like the word of God. He said that it's going to come in sheep's clothing. On the outside, it's going to look good. It's going to look uh, like, like it's from God. But the truth is, it, it's, it's a dangerous doctrine, and it will lead people away from God. Because inside, behind the sheep's clothing, are ravenous wolves that will destroy us. Jesus warns us about these false prophets, about people that are going to come and try to mislead us. But he also tells us how to be ready for them. He said, you will know them by their fruits. You see, if we study the scriptures and we study the Bible and know what the truth is, when someone comes along with false doctrine, we'll be able to, det we'll be able to detect it. We'll be able to know them by their fruits. See, if we study the Bible, we can detect false teachings. But not only that, if we look here in Psalm 119, verse 11, 
The psalmist says, Your word I have hidden in my heart, that I might not sin against you. The psalmist here is saying that he, he, he studies the, the, the word of God. He looked at the scriptures, put it into his heart. That way he may not sin against God. He can avoid the temptations of this world. He can avoid uh, falling into sin by the word of God. Studying the Bible, studying God's word and laying it to heart can help us to avoid false doctrine, avoid false teachers, but also help us to avoid temptations, sin. And that's important because temptation is one of the weapons of Satan. Satan brings temptations. He, he tries to tempt us to lead us to sin. That way you will fall away from God. But we can use the Bible to counter this. Jesus left us a great example of that. You might recall in, in Matthew 4 when Jesus was, uh, uh, was in, the, in the wilderness and Satan came and tempted him four, uh, three different times. Each temptation that Satan brought, Jesus quoted scripture. He says, for it is written, he quoted the scripture to avoid the, these temptations. Uh, Jesus had, had, um, had known the word of God. He had known what the scripture said. And that's why he was able to resist the temptation. But how did he get to that point? How did Jesus get to the point where he could just use the scripture to avoid sin? Well, he studied. Jesus had studied the word of God. If you look here in Luke 2, verse 46 to 47, it says, So now it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he, he was not born preaching the word of God. He was not born with, with all the knowledge that, that he had at one point because he had emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself when he came to this earth, which means he had to study again. He had to relearn those things. He had to study the scriptures. And the evidence we have of him studying is one we saw in the text that Jesus was asking questions. He was focused on learning more. He was trying to learn more, more about the word of God. He was trying to increase his knowledge in the scriptures. But also, it says that they were astonished by his answers. Well, that means Jesus had been studying prior to this. He had been studying before he got to the temple. Jesus spent his life studying the word of God. He had, this is him at 12 years old. So we can he studied before this, and he certainly studied after this. He spent his life studying the word of God. And because of that, he was able to resist, them, to resist the temptations of Satan. He was able to avoid sinning. And because Jesus was dedicated to God. Well, how dedicated was he? Later on in that chapter, if you look in Luke 2, uh, verses uh, 49, it says, And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? You see, at 12 years old, at the young age of 12, Jesus was fully committed to God and studying his word. And that is why he was able to resist Satan when he came. And it's the failure to have this commitment that so many people fall into sin today. That Satan pulls so many of us away and gets the victory over them. You know, people, some people don't spend much time studying the Word of God. They don't spend much time studying the Bible. And, and because of that, when sin comes along and temptation comes uh, to them, they get led away. Because they weren't prepared for it. They weren't prepared to stand against uh, the temptation that Satan brought. They weren't using their weapon, which is the Bible. We need to be studying the Bible. We need to make time for it. The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, you may recall when Jesus said that if you seek first the kingdom of God, he, he said to put God first, put God in his word first. And put, putting God first, seeking first the kingdom of God, means study, includes studying his word, making time to study the scriptures. So we need to study the Bible and, and gather the information in God's word. But in order to use the Bible, in order to use that information in our battle, we must obey the commandments found within it. It's not enough just to read. It's not enough just to know what the verses say. But we must follow it. You know, it, it was important that David had the stones. But if he would have left them in his sling, if he would have not taken them out, they would not have helped him, and he would have lost. Well, it's important that we study the Bible. It's important that we know what the Word of God is. But if we don't put it into action if, and we're not obeying, well, it's, not, it's going to be no use to us, and we stand no chance. We need, we need to take action. Just look at what Paul told Timothy. If you look here in 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 15, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
Now, this is exactly the point that we are trying to make today in, in this lesson. He, he, he's telling Timothy, he said, you have been taught the Holy Scriptures. You know the Word of God. You have studied the Scriptures. You, you know what it says. Now continue in them. Put it into action. Follow the Scriptures. Follow those commandments. Obey the Word of God. We must learn and obey. And that is how we use our weapon in our fight. And along with the stones, David used Goliath's sword as a weapon. He took Goliath's sword from him and cut the head off the giant. But just as David had picked up the sword of Goliath, we must pick up our Bible. We must pick up the Bibles and study them, study it, or else it will be no use to us. So we see what the weapon of the battle is. We see that we must study the Word of God, that our Bible is our weapon against Satan. But secondly, let's look at the warriors of the battle. You know, David's victory over Goliath is commonly used as a message of the small defeating the big. But after a closer examination of the story, it proves not to be the case at all. It, this is not an underdog story, because who was actually in the fight? Who, who was actually in this battle? Well, in, in 1 Samuel 17, 43, it says that Goliath was fighting along with his gods. But in, later on in verse 45, it says that David was fighting along with God. He was fighting with Jehovah. He was fighting with the living God. You see, David was not the underdog in his story, in this story, because he had God on his side. And, and Goliath uh, and stood no chance against God. He was no match for the Almighty God. But also, Goliath did not have the upper hand because his gods did not exist. The God that David served was the only God and is the only God. Therefore, Goliath stood no chance. Goliath was on his own while David had God. You see, Goliath was the underdog in the story. Goliath was the one that had to beat the odds. David was, was guaranteed the victory with the Lord. But David needed God to win this battle. If, he, if it were not for God, Goliath would have defeated David. Goliath would, ha, would have killed David. And some people may argue against that and say, well, no, it, it, David had, was already skilled with a sling. He was already talented with the weapons. As, uh, as 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 36 says that David had defeated a lion and a bear previously to this. And that is true. David had done, had, uh, had done those things. But notice what that same chapter says. In verse 37, it says that David attributes the slaughter of the lion and the bear to God delivering him, delivering him. He said it was God who delivered him from those animals that had protected him, that had watched over him, that when he was with God, he, he was able to make it through. But also David says it is God who delivered him from the Philistines. He said it was God who helped him beat Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, verse 37. David knew he needed God. He knew that if he, one, that if he didn't have God, he didn't stand the chance. But he also knew that if he had God, there was no chance of losing. Uh, and so just as David needed God in his battle, we need God in ours. We need God with us if we're going to survive. And God delivers Christians from two things that Satan brings, temptation and death. If you look here in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. See, so God provides the victory over temptation. He says there is no temptation that we can't overcome. There is no temptation that you face that Satan will bring that you can't bear, that you can't persevere through and avoid. But the verse doesn't stop there. Notice what it says. How do you avoid those temptations? How do you bear the temptation that Satan brings? By taking the way of escape that God provides. By following God. By being with God. And then when you're with God, you will, you, he will provide the way of escape for you. And you can avoid those temptations. Satan can't touch you if you're with God. Because he provides a way out. He provides a way of escape for us. But also he has the victory over death. And if you look in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 9 through 10. He says, yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. 
You see, God provides the victory over death. Satan, there's nothing that Satan can do to us physically that, that we can't overcome because God has already won. God has pro pro provided the victory over death. Death has no toll on us if we are with God. And, and that's very significant in this battle because sin leads to death, according to Romans 6, 23. And sin is one of Satan's weapons. Satan tempts us to lead us to sin because it leads to death. But if we have God, we can overcome temptation and sin, and we can have the victory over death. Satan sees, when we have God on our side, all of Satan's devices are useless. He, he, he has nothing, there's nothing he can do to us when we are with God. We must have God on our side if we're going to win. But don't underestimate Satan. He, he's not an enemy to be overlooked. We need to take this battle very seriously. As, as Peter says, if we look here in 1 uh, Peter 5, verse 8, he gives us the warning to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, this is a warning that Peter is giving us. He, he, he is warning us to be careful. He's, he's not saying to take this lightly. He's telling us to be sober and be vigilant, because if we don't take this seriously, Satan is going to devour us. Satan is not a foe that we can underestimate. We must take this ser seriously. We must be careful. But I think there's great significance in Peter referring to Satan as a lion. Because a lion is an animal that we can't beat on our own. If I'm by myself, I have no weapons and I have no one else to help me, and I come face to face with a lion, I stand no chance. That lion is going to devour me. I'm going to lose that battle every single time. But notice, a lion is an animal that God has defeated time and time again. You may recall that uh, in Judges 14, 5 through 6, that it was God who gave Samson the strength to kill the lion. And in 1 Samuel 17, 37, it was God who delivered David from the paw of the lion. But in Daniel 6, 22 to 23, it, it was God who kept Daniel unharmed by shutting the mouth of the hungry lion. Time and time again, God has defeated the lion. He, not only that, but he has protected his people from these lions, from these beasts. And Satan is no different. God will protect us from him if we are with him. God, we stand, Satan will beat us if we're on our own. But with God, we will win. And we, we cannot defeat Satan on our own, but we can if God is with us. Notice that God was with Paul during his struggles. If you look in 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18, he says, At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me, that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Notice what Paul is saying here. He's saying that everybody left him. Everybody had forsaken Paul. He was standing by himself. He had no help with him. Everybody had left, but he still had God. God was with him, and he says that God alone was enough to strengthen him. It's okay. That he may not have wanted to be alone. He may not have wanted everyone to leave him, but that's okay because he still had God, and God is enough. He says that God had strengthened him. God was with him, and that's why he was able to make it through. But notice, he also says that God delivered him from the paw of the lion. Again, God, there's no obstacle that we face that God can't protect us through. God will deliver us if we are with him. God is faithful to us and if we are faithful to him. And, and there's, no, there's nothing we, we can't lose if we are on his side. But uh, God defeated David's enemies, and God can defeat ours as well. Satan stands no chance. And we know this because if we look in, John, in James 4, 7 through 8, he says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James is saying, he says, submit to God. If you, if you cling to God and you are with him, and you, therefore, by, therefore you will resist the devil, and Satan's going to flee. He's going to run away because Satan stands no chance against God. But if we draw near to God, he is going to draw near to us. God welcomes us. He wants us to come to him. He wants to be with us. And he wants to, to us to rely on him and cling to him. And what better a, a person to cling to than God? Because God is, it can be, God, there's no one greater than God. And with God, 
we are protected. So we see that the weapons, we've already looked at the weapons of the battle. We've seen the warriors of the battle. But now let's look at the winners of the battle. You know, one of the scariest parts of battle is the risk of losing, is the risk of defeat, uh, of, of coming short uh, of, of the, and missing the mark. But you see, with God, there is no risk of losing. There is no chance of not making it through and not winning. See, David needed to win this battle with Goliath. He understood the circumstances. He understood how important this was that he won. So he made sure that God was with him because David knew that if he had God, he was already the winner. David understood that if he had God on his side, he was guaranteed the victory. This is a, a principle that, that the, sadly the Israelites must have forgotten because no one, uh, for those 40 days that no one rose to the challenge, they, must have, they forgot that, that God was with them and that God would deliver them. But David had faith in God. He knew that God will win, that g- there's no one greater than God, and God will win every single time. And, and our battle with Satan is also one of great importance. It, it, I think it's even greater importance because it, it's just the, the, the consequences of losing this battle with Satan are eternal. If we lose, it leads to eternal suffering. This is not a battle that we want to lose, that we can afford to lose. But fortunately, God does not leave this up to chance because he has already won. If we look in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 57, he says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we are in the greatest battle of our lives. We fight it every single day, day in and day out. We, we, we are in this fight, and we are fighting against our greatest enemy. But we can win this battle if we remember these three things. The weapons of the battle, which is the Bible. And we need to use the Bible to counter the attacks of Satan. And if we do so, we, that we can make it through and we can win. But also the warrior of the battle, that we're not fighting alone, that we have God on our side. But also, we also have his church. We, we, we're not, we, the, as, as, when David beat Goliath, the, the Israelites went with him. And when we are with God, we have the church with us. We are not alone. And we, we are not by ourselves. But also, we notice the winner of the battle, that God is the winner. And that if you are with God, you, you will not lose because you are guaranteed the victory because God has already won. Join the winning side. Don't, don't lay it up to chance. Don't, don't Put this off. Join God and win this fight. Thank you. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there, and sadly, so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. Don't even open their Bibles yet, and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion, or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people, or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the roadmap to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.
Gospel Broadcasting Network offers a free non-denominational Bible course. It's based strictly on God's Word and not the creeds or traditions of men. Why not contact us for lesson number one? Walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight. You may want to enroll by email. The address is info at gbntv.org. To enroll by phone, call us toll free at 888-805-3390.